Hello, and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about stories in movies, book shows, and games. And I stream on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. Today I'd like to have a chat about werewolves, because Kofi and Patreon combined to vote it in. Especially Patreon was very united on this front. And after talking about vampires, it only seemed fair. But link to that video in the description if you're interested. Now, let's dive straight into the origins of werewolves, so I can tell you about all the misconceptions we have about ancient history. Gather around the fire and let me tell you a tale. Let's start at the beginning. How did werewolves ever come to be? Many sources point toward the Epic of Gilgamesh as the first mention of a transformation from man to wolf. A woman had enchanted their former lover into the beast. Another mythological tale on this list is that of Zeus and Lycaon. In this story, a haughty king, Lycaon, was fortunate enough to have Zeus visit him personally. Except Lycaon decided it would be a good idea to test the god's divinity. To do so, he killed his own son, Nyctimus, and had him cooked for Zeus to see if he would eat it. Obviously he didn't, and instead cursed Lycaon into becoming a wolf, described as such. He tries to speak, but his voice broke into an echoing howl. His ravening soul infected his jaws. His murderous longings were turned on the cattle. He still was possessed by bloodlust. His garments were changed to a shaggy coat and his arms into legs. He was now transformed into a wolf. Zeus subsequently turned all of Lycaon's sons into wolves as well, except for Nyctimus, whom he restored to life, before ostensibly devastating the land with Deucalion's flood. These two tales are generally quoted as the first werewolf tale, and the Lycaon story has many versions, but personally, I don't really see a story where a person is incapable of ever turning back into a person as a werewolf tale. That's just a tale of some dude getting turned into an animal. We have lots of those, and we don't call them werewolves. Which means I don't accept these to be the origins of werewolfery. Poor sooth. Amateurs don't even understand the basics. Okay, how did you get in here? I... Doggy door? And what are you doing here? Well, since you're talking about me, I thought I'd interject from time to time. Aha. Uh -huh. Ooh, ooh. At least change your pants. Uh, no. I'm afraid I believe werewolf stories have a far more mundane source. It's people dressing up as wolves. For various reasons, of course. Back in the day, people would often wear the skins of predators for hunting purposes, alongside rituals involving the same attire. And this is not purely a European folklore rumor either. The Native American tribes, the Pawnee, were called wolves by neighboring tribes for wearing wolf hides while they went out to rob or spy in order to avoid detection. Likewise, when they were on the warpath, they would often wear robes made of wolf skin. While initially not used as such, the wearing of a wolf skin was now used not just for hunting animals, but for hunting humans too. The supernatural element only came into play when they realized it could be used to strike fear in the hearts of men. Spiritual leaders would thus sometimes claim that they could in fact transform into a wolf entirely. As said, this wasn't just a European thing, or just a Native American thing. Hunting was universal, and as humans do, they often invent things in very similar ways. From The Origin of the Werewolf Superstition by Caroline Taylor Stewart. The point in common everywhere is the transformation of a living human being into an animal, into a wolf in regions where the wolf is common, into a lion, hyena or leopard in Africa where these animals are common, into a tiger or serpent in India, in other localities into other animals characteristic of the region. Among Laps and Finns occur transformations into the bear, wolf, reindeer, fish or birds, amongst many North Asiatic peoples, as also some American Indians, into the bear, amongst the latter also into the fox, wolf, turkey or owl, in South America, besides into a tiger or jaguar, also into a fish or a serpent. Most universal though, it seems, was the transformation into wolves or dogs. Depending on the place, a whole zoo worth of animals was available for transformation myths. But as said, the wolf and dog was most universal. And this went back far. Very far. A Greek historian named Herodotus, during the 5th century before Christ, described a nomadic group of people called the Noiri, who, according to him, 
transformed into wolves several days of the year. In Norse myths, we have the Berserkers who, while most well known for their transformations into a bear when battle rage struck, also have a canine version. Ulf Bjalfason, also known as Kveldulf, Old Norse for Night Wolf, was a Viking military commander and Ulfjetnar. Like berserkers, they turned into animals, but this time a wolf. But the idea of these wolf people being unclean of some kind didn't really come into play until much later. In Virgil's Eclogue 8, only a few years before the Common Era, a man named Morris would change himself into a werewolf using herbs and poisons. He would spend his time calling ghosts from the grave. In Germany, while one could transform into a wolf by wearing their skin, it was also said that transformation was possible by wearing the skin of a hanged man. The Armenian werewolf was oft a sinful woman, doomed to become a werewolf for seven years. First, she would eat her own children, and then her entire family's children too, followed by strangers, of course. Upon approach, doors would fling out of their locks for her, so she could come and gobble you up. I think the last tale is most obvious. The werewolf myth became something of a way to control people by the church, too. Like most monsters. The Rougarou was a werewolf likely brought to America by the French. The Cajun legends tell of the beast prowling the swamps, sugarcane fields and woodlands surrounding the area in the shape of a human body with a wolf or dog's head. Catholic children would be told the story of the Rougarou to keep them on the right path. If you didn't follow the rules of Lent, the commemoration of Jesus' 40 days of fasting in the desert, for seven years in a row, you'd turn into a Rougarou. So pretty lenient, as ultimatums go, really, but still. As werewolf beliefs spread more commonly, of course the general populace would do their best to identify their neighbors before they turned into a wolf at all. Very quickly, unexplained conditions would be ascribed to werewolfery instead. Rabies was an easy target, of course. Some wolves went mad, biting other animals and sometimes people, spreading rabies to their targets and causing them to go ostensibly mad. There's also an affliction called, in these days at least, Werewolf syndrome, or hypertrichosis. It causes the body to produce hair in rather unexpected places, such as the face. I'm sure you can see how they might be accused of being a secret wolf when their face, among other things, is absolutely covered in a lush, furry coat. You better believe accusations went flying. Anything from a unibrow to overly long nails could get you busted, and fear especially exploded alongside the more widely known Witch Trials Werewolf belief in general developed quite parallel to that of witches in most of Europe, along with its trials. Apparently Switzerland was the place of origin for these trials, although it never reached the same numbers as witchery. This is in part due to the fact werewolves were often accused of witchcraft all the same. They do go hand in hand, after all. In fact, in my homeland of the Netherlands, being a werewolf was synonymous with being a witch. One such Dutch trial resulted in the execution of four people. The suicide of one and the escape of another. Volker Dirks, alongside his children, Hendrikje, Hessel, Albert, Gijsbert and Dirk, was accused of evil sorcery. And Albert didn't make things easy because he straight up claimed that they would all turn into wolves or cats under the command of Satan all the time, alongside other people who would then dance with the devil and kill animals. Easy for him to say because he, alongside his brothers, were spared death due to their age. They merely got whipped. Coincidentally, once you were accused of werewolfery, whoever you accused alongside you was quite doomed as well. So if you did have a rather large bone to pick with anyone in particular, once in the gallows, you could drag them down with you in a single sentence. Yes, John from the bakery always went howling with me on Sundays, I swear. And off John goes, roasting at the stake beside you. It's not strange, therefore, that some people prefer to spin a lie that would suit the narrative. In 1691, a Latvian man named Thies was accused of being a werewolf. To everyone's surprise, he pled guilty to the charges immediately, but also claimed that he and his fellow werewolves were in fact agents of God, who fought the devil and his sorcerers. They were called the Hounds of God and would descend into hell every so often to keep the demons at bay. At that point, it's God's word against the witch hunters, so 
Yes, he walked free. The only thing they could eventually do anything about is his use of blessings that did not invoke the power of God. So he was flogged and banished for life. And werewolf trials in general were always a little bit off when compared to witch trials either way, because outright confessing was quite common. Perhaps because they thought a confession might save their loved ones, or because they knew full well that they were guilty of crimes regardless. Quite a lot of people accused of werewolfery were actually serial killers, among other things. In fact, Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, Spain's first recorded serial killer, claimed to be a werewolf. Others were cannibals or grave robbers. In other cases, the werewolves were, well, just wolves doing wolf things. For that reason, being a werewolf was used as an excuse more than anything. They lost their senses and couldn't be held accountable for their actions. Although it rarely worked, it was worth a try. Especially when you factor in that most people accused of witchcraft and all adjacent crafts would be tortured into a guilty verdict anyway, even when they were entirely blameless. Some, like Jacques Roulet, went a step further and said, well, Yes, I did murder this boy, but hey, I murdered a bunch of other people too, so this is nothing. A witch! No, no, uh, see, uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> a werewolf! <gasps> a werewolf! No, I'm nice, see, I, I, I fight demons for God. <gasps> I... Oh, I, I, okay, I don't really have a script for that. Well, you could, I don't know, let me leave to... Fight demons? I suppose so? Uh, have a nice day? Thank you! But this you'll never know who is and isn't one game had the awful side effect of dragging those ever so slightly different from the pack into trials very quickly. I don't need to tell you that anyone with a mental disability was a very easy target and they could do little to defend themselves, especially when werewolf accounts would most often come from simple onlookers. The proof required was a quick, no, I saw one, I swear, trust me, bro, and you'd be off to the cells. Gervais of Tilbury was one man who just could not stop himself from making up werewolves left and right, and quite literally used, there are many other witnesses to plead his case. Although thankfully, he wouldn't generally point out anyone in the near vicinity. One of the men he tells of, Chosevere, he said would take off his clothes to roll in the sand during his transformation, and then he would run off with his mouth wide open. Why? Well, because Chosevere had told Gervais that wolves can only open their mouth with great difficulty, and they need both paws to unlock their jaws, so once unlocked, they just leave it open. And, says Gervais, if Chosevere knew that wolf secret, he simply had to be a werewolf. Thankfully, we had extremely accurate tests to check if someone was really a werewolf, of course. Outside of the general telltale signs like a unibrow, curved fingernails, bristles under one's tongue, or low-set ears, you could cut into their flesh to see if there was fur in the wound. In wolf form, they would have no tail. They were larger and had human eyes and a human voice. In some Swedish tales, for this reason, werewolves could be recognized because they ran on three legs stretching the fourth outward to look like a tail. Recently buried corpses were also a preferred midnight snack for the wolven beasts, so that would be a great spot to make camp. Please ignore the fact that wolves would in fact eat freshly buried corpses when there was no other food available, or that grave robbers existed. Ignore all of that, it's werewolves. No real werewolves were ever caught, of course, but they certainly cleaned the streets of at least some terrible people. As I mentioned, serial killers and cannibals were often accused of being a werewolf, and it's probably not a bad thing to get those on the pyre, but there were also people like Peter Stubb who was convicted of asking the devil for the power to turn into a wolf so he might commit crimes with impunity. During said wolf times, he allegedly committed incest with his daughter and ate his own son. He was summarily flayed with red-hot pincers, his arms and legs broken, his head chopped off and his body burned, after which they stuck his head on top of a wolf's corpse to be seen by all. And by this point, most historians believe Peter was merely a scapegoat at the time.
Other times, the perpetrator was just a very regular wolf, or even a pack of wolves, such as our final trial story, The Beast of Gévaudan. Granted, it wasn't much of a trial, more an outright hunt. Presumably, the beast was a very large wolf that spread terror across the French countryside by killing between 60 and 100 adults and injuring more than 30, although some estimate the real number of deaths to be around 500. Victims would have their throats torn out and were often partially eaten. After several children disappeared, a hunt was called. Several very important people bungled that hunt, but killed a lot of other wolves in the process, until the real beast was eventually killed during a very regular local hunt. Of course, they tried to add strange details to the story, like he prayed before he shot the creature, or it was shot with a homemade bullet forged from molten-down Virgin Mary's medals. But none of that actually happened. It was very likely just a pack of wolves that found the local villagers easy pickings. To everyone else, however, this was most definitely a werewolf. So how does one change into a werewolf? And how do you cure it? Is there a cure at all? The stories on that are myriad as well, and none of them are pleasant, to no one's surprise. A lot of what we currently count among the, well yes, obviously, facts about werewolf transformations is actually quite recent. Even though getting bit by a wolf could cause rabies and that gave some people an inkling, the most common way of changing into a werewolf was the wearing of a pelt. Yes, just like the hunters it originated from. Although it transformed into just a belt made of the skin of the targeted animal instead. And likely because a single belt was a lot easier to hide and put on or take off. Said belt was often gifted to a person by the devil, of course, he does so love his fashion. And lacking a belt, it would be a simple curse. The curse variety, especially, was the reason a lot of earlier werewolves actually took on a rather sympathetic look but we'll get to that later. The full moon also wasn't a prerequisite for transformations. Merely the wearing of the skin or belt or the activation of the curse, whatever its stipulation might be. In fact, the only reference I could find in ancient history that mentioned a full moon was one from 1214 by the previously mentioned Gervas of Tilbury, the man who couldn't stop making up stories. He mentioned that in Auvergne, France, people would transform into wolves during the full moon. And quite honestly, I couldn't even check whether or not he really said that, because his only account is found in the Otia Imperialia, and my handle on Latin is quite poor, I'm afraid. Not to worry, there are plenty more ways to transform into a wolf outside of wearing skins. You could rub your body with a magic salve, drink rainwater out of the footprint of the animal in question, or even from an enchanted stream. In ancient Greece, you could eat the meat of a wolf mixed with that of a human, although that transformation into a wolf was irreversible. There were elaborate rituals, usually demonic or linked to witchcraft, or if you're a woman, you had to go out during midnight, plant four sticks in the ground, and stretch the membrane which envelops a fowl when born between it. Then crawl through it while naked. You would be able to deliver your children without pain, but if they were a boy, they'd all be werewolves. Yes, that one is a little bit elaborate, I'll admit. So I could just bite you. I really think it's faster. No, no. You see that? That sounds painful. Uh, let's, let, let's do something else. Okay, well, uh, we have dancing in the moonlight for 36 consecutive hours. Yeah, that'll probably kill me. Right. Uh, well, how about getting murdered during a full moon? That, that literally kills me. No, oh, you're right, of course. Uh, maybe you can convince a wolf spirit to choose you? I'm not a Pokemon. Well, what do you want from me here? Is this really necessary research for your werewolf video? I have to become the wolf. Just sell your soul to Satan. No, he charges interest. Okay, I'm going to bite you now. There's actually one ritual that included the full moon. You'd have to sleep outside on a very specific Wednesday or Friday during the summer night with the full moon shining directly on your face. Really, the strike a pact with Satan method seems the easiest one. Although, if you piss off an angel enough, they would also sometimes curse you with the werewolf affliction. And that happened a weird amount in the past, apparently. And sometimes entire tribes would be covered in said curses. A story from Ireland tells of the native people of Ossory, cursed by the Saint Natalis to have two natives, a man and a woman, be a wolf 
for seven years, and then they turn back into humans for another pair to take their place. One day, a wolf walked up to a priest and started speaking to him, asking him to administer the viaticum to his dying wife, who was a wolf as well. The priest hesitated, of course, so the wolf peeled back his wife's skin, and under the she-wolf's fur was a frail old woman. Eventually, people started to self-diagnose with werewolfery, and while some were simply very violent and admitted to the hospital involuntarily, some were self-admitted because they feared their own condition. None of them actually suffered from physical transformations, of course, but it was certainly a form of insanity. So many of them appeared, in fact, that doctors needed to create a new term just for this strange phenomenon, lycanthropy. I guess I'll stop calling it werewolfery now then. Actually, no, I like that better. Clinical lycanthropy, or werewolfery, was a rare psychiatric syndrome that involved the delusion that the affected person can transform into, has transformed into, or is an animal. Which, mind you, is not limited to wolves. Everything from birds to bees is a possibility. There's also something called lycanthropic intermetamorphosis, which means you think other people have transformed into animals. A study noted that, after the consumption of ecstasy, a man displayed symptoms of paranoid psychosis by claiming that his relatives had changed into various animals, such as a boar, a donkey, and a horse. Something tells me that state of mind wasn't permanent and he was just, well, on drugs. Most of these patients were stuffed in a clinic somewhere, never to see the light of day again. Except if you're a rich Russian boy, then you apparently have Sigmund Freud attend to you personally to figure out you're just really, really obsessed with wolves. No, that's not a joke. But what does one do about all this werewolfery? How do you cure it? If you've watched movies or read books, then you'll no doubt know about the silver bullet. The only prominent example of this weapon being used, however, was in a version of the story of the Beast of Gévaudan. And even that's debatable. There are even some accounts that note that even if a bullet of a rare metal was used, it wasn't silver, but mercury. This being a mistranslation thing, silvery metal was the written form used, and if it really was mercury, then yes, I've no doubt it'd be lethal to most creatures. That's technically a cure, but silver does come back often enough. When stabbed with a silver dagger, a werewolf would turn back into a human, and a silver amulet stuffed with wolf's bane could stop a person from transforming at all. But those are, somehow, the kinder methods. As with most supernatural evil, there was money to be made and charlatans ready to make it. I include doctors in this list. Like every single ailment in the world at the time, a lot of people, including medical professionals, thought bloodletting was the solution. Just bleed the wolf out, so to speak. Replace the wolf blood with regular, clean human blood and you'd be golden. Except most people died from the excessive blood loss before that could happen. There was also vomiting, yes, again, casting the wolf out in the most visceral of ways. Or vinegar drinking, a lot of vinegar drinking. And drinking a whole lot of that, I don't need to tell you, isn't exactly great for the body either. Most of these cures were often so severe and so violent to the body that largely the patient would die before being healed. But taking things out of the body or putting too much of something into it wasn't the only cure attempted. In ancient Greece, they would quite literally try to exhaust the wolf out of you by making you do a lot of manual labor and converting you to Christianity. Funny how both of these things benefit someone else in the process, but at least it wasn't as awful as one particularly ridiculous cure that stated one should pick a spot and kneel there for a hundred years. What's that you say? Humans don't live quite that long, especially when they likely didn't start kneeling the moment they were born? Nonsense. It's a surefire cure. But don't worry, there were some cures that truly didn't seem to harm the wolf creature. As I mentioned earlier, transformation often occurred after one put on a wolf pelt or belt, just as sometimes they needed their human clothes to return to human form. Burning these items would sometimes lift the spell entirely, and while holy water and crosses don't do anything to stop a werewolf, although perhaps they'd be more effective when directly cursed by the devil, salt works just fine, as it does with most monsters. 
Love was also an effective cure in many stories, especially the kind where the wolfman comes off as sympathetic. All he needed was a pure Christian woman to love him and he'd be quite alright. The final measure would of course be death, with the corpse destroyed immediately after. Elsewise, the werewolf might return to life as a vampire werewolf. They didn't call it that yet, of course, as werewolf beliefs predate vampire beliefs, but it would certainly be a blood-drinking wolf who would especially love the taste of dying soldiers. As an aside, just to confuse the general population further, in Serbia, both the werewolf and the vampire are known collectively as Vukodlak. The same goes for the Greek Rikolakas and several others. Perhaps this is partially the reason why vampires are so closely linked to wolves in many forms of media too, with their ability to transform into or control wolves. So that's ancient werewolves for you, some of them anyway. But a lot of this type of werewolfery isn't really seen in modern-day werewolves anymore. That all started with literature, of course, so let's begin there. Stories about werewolves are old, very old. So old, some of them even show up in certain creation myths. In Armenia, a legend exists that tells of a young married couple, the woman a werewolf. Once, when washing a guest's feet, she noticed they were very white and tender, so she tried to eat the guest at night. However, the guest stabbed the she-wolf in the breast with his dagger, causing milk to squirt from her breast into the sky, creating the Milky Way. Why don't they write books about that anymore? Hey, John, listen, I think somebody brought a dog into the building and... John? There is no dog. O okay, John, are you okay, buddy? Yes, I'm fine. Is this about all your ideas being utter shite? But it, it's not that they're not creative, it's just... My ideas? Uh, yeah. You have, you have very strange ideas about video games. Especially... <laughs> ah! We're going to add milk squirting werewolves to our next game. <laughs> and the werewolf will have a foot fetish. <laughs> Please. <laughs> the twist is that she's the awful dead mayor of a nearby town returned to life as a wolf. D d d that, that's so, so sp specific. I will bite you. Okay, fine. Milk squirting dead mayor wolf it is. One of the earliest proper written stories about werewolves was that of Hugh, the werewolf, in 1838. It's a story about a family suspected of being werewolves, even though they're not. When the entire family save the son dies, he eventually resorts to wearing an old wolf outfit to scare the local butcher into giving him his meat. Stop that, get your mind out of the gutter, he does this purely to survive because no one will give him work. One day that butcher's had enough and chops off his hand so he can prove who the werewolf is. Except he didn't account for his niece falling in love with said werewolf. When he visits the rickety cottage the boy lives in, now minus one hand, his niece was already there, hiding under the blankets. The butcher taunts Hugh, asking him to show him his hand, but when his niece shows hers from under the covers instead, he loses his mind. To put salt in the wound, his niece brings the chopped off hand along and proceeds to scare her uncle with it until he drowns himself, still clutching the hand, so she can marry her werewolf boy. At no point during this story does Hugh ever hurt anyone, he just means to scare them in order for him to not die. Which is important to him, I wager. He's also not really a werewolf, it's all assumptions. A story about prejudice and love, of course, and a story quite sympathetic towards the werewolf. He and his family was ostracized ever since he was a boy, and even after all he went through, he made sure to emphasize that he did not want to physically hurt anyone, just scare them. And then love saved him. He was never truly cursed with lycanthropy, of course. It was more a metaphor than anything, but the reader gets the point. It's bad to other people. Prejudice gets you drowned in the river while clutching a severed hand, as it should. But they're not all quite like that. Another well-known tale from 1857 is a little less sympathetic. Mind you, initially the protagonist is an old man, abandoned by all, sad and alone. But that doesn't last long. This one is called Wagner der Werwolf. Wagner der Werwolf tells of an old German man who had seen his entire family die by the Black Plague. When his granddaughter also disappears, he makes a bargain with Faust, which gives him back his youth and riches, but he's also a murderous werewolf. 
He doesn't want to kill anyone, but feels it's worth the price. When Satan tries to bargain for his soul as well, however, Wagner refuses three times, eventually freeing him from the curse through divine intervention. Wagner is fully responsible for his situation. He's not a bad person, just a reluctant, sad man. A bit of an in-between. In Le Meigneur de Loup, or The Wolf Leader in English, however, the protagonist is awful. He makes a deal with the devil to ensure all his wicked wishes come true. Which they do, but he turns more into a wolf every time he makes one. His wishes obviously backfire, and he's only saved when he realizes that Agnelette, a woman he used to care for, has died. He prays to God to take his life instead of hers, and his soul is freed. This wolf was a dick, no question about it. Everything he did was selfish, until he was faced with the consequences of his actions. In general, most wolf tales of these times revolved around the devil, in some shape or form, seducing a man into wolfhood. Be it by promising eternal youth and beauty, power, or sometimes both. While folk tales focused a great deal more on random curses or witches, these newer stories put the blame wholly on the individual, accepting the devil's bargain. And of course, God would be the one to get them out of their self-inflicted mess. And yes, most of these werewolves, if not all of them, were men. Claimed by many to be one of the first tales with a woman as the wolf was The Werewolf by Clemens Annie Hausman. And I'm not sure if this is better than having the devil be the great evil or worse. The protagonist is named Christian, and he defeats the evil, seducing wolf woman White Fell by bleeding his pure Christian blood all over her. I'm not joking, his blood is holy water, because he's such a devout, pure boy. And when his brother finds his body, he is lying in a cross shape like Jesus on the crucifix. I don't think I need to hammer home the message here, but in short, don't trust the evil woman, she might have other intentions and always listen to Christ. Werewolves certainly came a long way since then. The last werewolf-related book I feel I certainly have to mention is The Werewolf of Paris. Some call it the Dracula of werewolves, but I don't think such a book exists, unfortunately. The protagonist, Bertrand, is a horrible, rotten serial killer, and so is his girlfriend. However, no one cares that there's a werewolf on the loose because it takes place in 19th century France, and I don't need to tell you that was a bloody time in and of itself. It didn't need a werewolf, and that's the whole point. The novel is more social commentary on the nature of humanity as a whole, and less on Bertrand as a person. He's a vessel, more or less, nothing more. The werewolf doesn't even get all that much attention, and nobody cares overly much to figure out who the mysterious killer even is. So, as a werewolf book in general, it's fine, but nothing great. What I do think it addresses well is the werewolf as a representation of repressed sexual deviancy trope, along with a lot of other repressed things, probably. And this idea gains traction in media eventually, so it certainly had a great deal of influence in that respect, even if the story's message otherwise is, well, yes, there's a werewolf and that sucks, but look at how many people are getting murdered by the government anyway, so who cares? Oh, hey, wow. Calm down, buddy. No, no, it's it's all right. You uh, wanna share some of that? What? Share the meat? I'm, I'm pretty hungry. Downfall of the country and all that. I I'm eating a person, yet yeah, I can see that. Hey, did you get to the hips yet? I dibs on the hip meat, if not. You're demented. Well, we live in a society, you know. Werewolves are pretty whatever. That's fair, dig in. The werewolf was no longer tragic. Instead, it was truly the beast inside. Your repressed feelings, whatever they might be, come out to play in your wolf form. Just as vampires were often a vessel of sexual deviancy, the werewolf was pure rage, fittingly animalistic in its expression, which meant that in a lot of newer media, the moon didn't really need attention either. The wolf's nature could be triggered by any single upsetting emotion. There are plenty of examples in recent movies and series of werewolves simply deciding to become a werewolf because their nature is inherently a part of them, and they're in full control only until rage takes over, and at that point, they rip and tear and nothing more. Notwithstanding certain subversions of the genre, of course, like Terry Pratchett's Discworld, which boasts Captain Delphine Angua von Überwald of the Angmoorpork City Watch. She's quite nice and only occasionally eats chickens, which she pays for after the fact, of course. Or Lupine, who transforms into a human-like form every full moon, but otherwise remains a wolf. 
As a native duchy, I also had the pleasure of reading Dolfje Weerwolfje, a cute werewolf book for kids that still had sun scares for a kid-sized me, but of course those rarely get put on the big screen. So what does? Well, let's see. Films and television is what really catapulted werewolves into the limelight. Where the novels were received well enough, they never had a true Dracula moment, which is also why there wasn't really a standard available for the werewolf character. The earliest movies, the silent ones, certainly didn't help, as the werewolves used there were just regular wolves. There were no transformations, no bloody scenes of a wolfman ripping through his victims, no. The first big splash was Werewolf of London, the first movie to make use of a sort of anthropomorphic creature. This movie has all the new popular standard fare, the bite of another werewolf turning the protagonist, a transformation in the light of the moon, and of course, sympathy. It's how literature starts and movies follow suit. The protagonist thanks his killer when he eventually dies by the end of the movie, thankful to be rid of this curse that made him kill without mercy. You're perhaps wondering why the way one becomes a werewolf and how they transform became so standardized over the years, especially in film. And, well, ask yourself, what's a better cinematic look? Some dude walking over to his secret stash to take off all his clothes and put on a belt, or some dude getting attacked by a vicious beast, only for them to start transforming in horrifying ways when the full moon rises above the scenery? Yes, most of these tropes were added simply because it looked better. And the full moon isn't that much of a stretch anyway. Moon lunacy existed. The strange belief that during a full moon, people became more violent. There is no actual proof that this happens, mind you. Like I said, it's purely a belief people have. In fact, moon lunacy is a bit double either way because lunacy means moonstruck. So used to describe regular madness and epilepsy in ancient Greece by, among others, Aristotle, as they believed these problems were caused by the moon. Making the moon the trigger for a raging werewolf isn't that far-fetched. So yes, Werewolf of London made the werewolf anthropomorphic. However, werewolf movies in general didn't really gain popularity until The Wolfman, which popularized the rhyme, even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. The Wolfman follows Larry Talbot, who returns home to bury his dead brother. While there, he falls in love with a local girl and buys a nice silver wolf-headed cane to impress her. Except he finds himself fighting a werewolf and whacks him to death with said cane. Unfortunately for him, he does get bitten first and so the werewolfing begins. It only ends in, ironically, his father John beating him to death with his own silver cane. A Roma lady who had warned Larry throughout the movie arrives and speaks another rhyme over his body. The way you walked was thorny, through no fault of your own. But as the rain enters the soil, the river enters the sea, so tears run to a predestined end. Your suffering is over, my son. At this, Larry turns back into a man. The Wolfman is what made werewolves popular, almost on the same footing as vampires. The movie was remade in 2010, and apparently another is in the works. The 2010 remake wasn't well received, but I actually really liked it. They subvert our expectations by renaming Larry to Lawrence and making his father John a werewolf, among other things. In doing so, they added both the vicious, bloodthirsty werewolf, John, and the sympathetic victim werewolf, Lawrence, to the same movie. It's a nice juxtaposition, because for some reason, the werewolf that evolved was the sympathetic wolf. While in literature, writers started moving away from that concept further and further, in film, the monster still existed, but it was far more often used as a very obvious metaphor. Where vampires moved towards the suave aristocrat stereotype, werewolves became the tortured soul stereotype. A good example, and one of my favorite werewolf movies, is Ginger Snaps. The movie deals with two sisters, Ginger and Bridget. They're both outcasts, known mostly for the pictures they take of their own fake deaths. That is, until one day, Ginger starts her first period. At that exact moment, she's attacked by a werewolf, which begins her transformation into one. Yes, this is an allegory for bodily changes in teenagers in general. Ginger starts to change her personality rapidly. She was always the one that developed first, but now she's very clearly known as the hot one, the one boys want to sleep with. 
The other sister, Bridget, resents the idea because she feels like she's losing her sister. She doesn't want her to change, but change is inevitable and it manifests as a literal beast in this case. Lycanthropy also spreads like an STD here, driving the message home just a little more. Eventually, the movie turns into a story of Bridget trying her best to help Ginger come to terms with the changes to her body and their mother blaming herself for the gruesome murders her daughter commits. The movie does not have a happy ending, which is the case for most werewolf movies, to be fair. The beast always dies, because it has to. Once out of control, there is no way to stop it. It almost feels like a warning when the theme revolves around abuse, because unlike vampires, werewolves tend to lose control of their senses. I've found various tales of love's attempt to fix a werewolf's curse, each ending in the death of the lover, usually a petite woman to represent purity of some kind. Unfortunately, especially in current media, there's this myth going around that even if your lover is violent and abusive, as long as you love them hard enough, you'll be able to fix them. That plays wonderfully with the werewolf, because no you can't. In the 2010 remake of The Wolfman, I feel they address this perfectly. The woman in question still feels she can save Lawrence to a point, but when it comes down to it, and he does in fact pause to kill her, she still pulls the trigger and kills him. It acknowledges that while they may have had good times, he's a monster, and potential death or injury is not worth the attempts to get through to whatever humanity's left in him. Werewolves in general can be a stand-in for any and all troubles of the mind. In An American Werewolf in London, for example, it's about survivor's guilt. Two men are attacked by a werewolf and one of them gets mauled to death, while the other is only hurt but gets away alive, now as a werewolf. A werewolf in that sense is just the darkness within showing itself on the outside. The transformations are almost always shown as a painful process. The recipient of the curse might run off to murder others, but they do so against their will, as the wolf takes hold of them in torturous fashion. Especially in the previously mentioned An American Werewolf in London, he's racked with guilt and it physically hurts him. This stands in stark contrast to, for example, The Howling. There, a serial killer takes pleasure in his murders and, as such, he seems to very much enjoy his transformation, relishes in the fear it causes even. In that sense, morality seems linked with the wolf. Good people fight it, making the process extremely painful. Bad people embrace it because this is their true self, the self they otherwise can't show because of pitiful excuses like murder being illegal. But there is really only so much you can do with a character that, in effect, becomes just a beast in the end. You can develop the character, but where does the wolf come in beyond that? Movies try to do new things, of course, mostly in terms of transformations too, the Howling 4 had a guy melt his skin off, after which he takes a bath in said molten skin, while other werewolves chant, Satan calls you, before he himself turns into a werewolf. It's a pity the Howling movies became absolutely dreadful after the first one, but you get the point. At least it was different. No, movies had to evolve. And in the age of serialized stories, we were given hot werewolves. You know, hot werewolves. Oh, you know exactly what I mean. Here goes nothing. What the hell are you doing? You don't live in the world you think you do. Jacob, put your clothes on. Yeah, those. The kind that will inevitably take off their shirt first before turning into a wolf, but not their pants. Why? Do you know how expensive a good pair of pants is? No, don't answer that. I know why. <sighs> anyway, this evolution happened around the same time as vampires got hot. But then again, vampires had been hot in the public eye for a while now. Interview with the vampire saw to that. And a change often added was also sentience. Some stories of the past did have sentience, but not often and not generally to this degree. The werewolves in Twilight can turn into a wolf any time, any day, after taking their shirt off, of course. And as wolves, they're still capable of communicating and making rational decisions. In many ways, the werewolf part just became a gimmick. The wolves also became more and more powerful, where before they would only be vulnerable to certain items, now they were almost entirely invulnerable, had wolverine levels of healing, super speed and strength, and so on and so forth. When you think of a werewolf in the current media landscape, you just think of a buff, hot guy who sometimes turns into a wolf but then becomes hot again. Or sometimes they don't even become a wolf, 
In Sirius the Jaeger, the wolf people just get a little more toothy and aggressive when they lose control. That's about it. And speaking of Sirius the Jaeger, lovely transition, I know. We do need to talk about the vampires versus werewolf conflict as well. At some point, when werewolves and vampires both became quite popular, people started pitting them against each other. Which, again, is interesting, given that werewolves and vampires started out as basically the same thing. But when Wolfman vs Dracula was pitched, and eventually scrapped, people started thinking about it a little too hard. I talk about this a little more in detail in my Vampires video, link in the description if you're interested. But long story short, because some guy had to get himself a Frankenstein movie but failed to do so in time, he was forced to buy a werewolf versus vampire movie instead to play in his theaters, pretending like the Frankenstein family had just become werewolves. Whoops, he started a conflict for the ages. In Sirius the Jaeger, it's made clear that vampires look down on werewolves. The vampires in the series are afflicted with a disease that sees them lose agency entirely and becoming, in essence, a beast before their inevitable death. Literally dying like dogs. The worst thing they can see themselves become is something akin to a werewolf. Of course, this is still an anime, so the werewolf protagonist does indeed become god by the end, but you get the point. This is a running theme. In Underworld, one of my favorite series of all time, judge me all you like, lichens and vampires technically had the same core bloodline, given that each faction spawned from one half of a set of brothers, literally twins. Their immortal gene evolved differently, however, one being bitten by a wolf, the other a bat, and so their war began. Eventually, the less powerful generations of werewolves, now called lichens, became slaves to the vampires. Werewolves in practically every piece of media I've seen are seen as the savage lesser. Ironically, in Sirius the Jaeger, we get a quote from one of Sirius's allies that really fits their predicament. Sirius is the werewolf, of course. Are you all right, miss? I just killed someone! <laughs> it's all right. It's not human. It's all right. It's not human. That's generally how we see monsters. This particular quote was about a vampire, of course, but what an awful thing to say! If something's not human, it's okay to kill it? I resent that notion. Uh, yeah. So do I, which is why I brought it up. In most media, werewolves are shown to be simple human beings with the occasional problem. Sure, there are some who enjoy the killing, but most lose their mind during the kill or try their best to restrain themselves before they transform so as not to hurt anybody. And if you paint werewolf, or in this case vampires, as not human so it doesn't matter, does that mean if you're not normal enough to pass as a human being, you don't matter? As long as a creature is capable of thought, shouldn't that be enough to consider said thought? I agree entirely. Just because I ate the occasional human heart. Oh, okay, hold on. Or have a few livers on the side? You're not really making your case here. Sometimes I just crave blood. Uh, uh, cut to commercial. <laughs> Also, people keep making the wolf from Red Riding Hood a werewolf and Red a werewolf hunter. What's up with that? Anyway, uh, werewolf shows are all over the place at this point. Although, granted, even years back we had some interesting outliers like Bang Face, a cartoon that's basically Scooby Doo, but one of them's a werewolf and he's really, really dumb. Bang Face, Pugsy! Are we glad to see you? Quick, Bang Face, get him out and be quiet. <laughs> In The Order, a Netflix show I binged for this video, they actually bring back the wearing the fur coat to become a wolf idea, which I thought was a very nice touch, even if the coats are sentient. They also have the balls to have their werewolves take off all of their clothes before transforming, not just the shirt. And Netflix cancelled it after two successful seasons, just like The Dark Crystal. I can't keep getting away with it. That being said, we still have some games to look at. But not that many. This chapter is going to be weirdly short. Yeah, unfortunately, werewolf games are few and far between, and I hesitate to say any of them are particularly good. Where vampires get Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, The Legacy of Cain Games, Castlevania, hell, even Vampire. Werewolves get Werewolf the Apocalypse. Oh boy. 
That game is based on the same World of Darkness series as Vampire the Masquerade, and honestly, the lore is very interesting. The game just isn't. Control-wise, graphics-wise, story-wise, oh man, I really cannot overstate enough how bad this game looks. President Watkins in person. I don't think you understand what's at stake here. <laughs> oh, I understand that you've just been attacked and you're looking to hit back. I also understand that you need our ammunition to do that. And we've got that ammunition right downstairs. This is a 2021 game release. With so few werewolf games in general, this was the one I was really looking forward to as well. I know technically Bigby from The Wolf Among Us isn't a werewolf, but I'm claiming him anyway. There is one werewolf game that I actually thought was quite decent story-wise, just not very good game-wise. The Order 1886. This game gets a lot of hate for being mostly cutscenes and very little gameplay, and a lot of even that gameplay was quick time events. But it doesn't look really good. And while there aren't many werewolves around, look, we have to take something. And this game wasn't nearly as bad as everyone made it out to be. So yeah, that's our best game. If you can buy it on sale. Our only other option is Yugo from Bloody Roar, which I, I love Bloody Roar, but I feel like that's cheating. The werewolves in Dragon Age Origins are, while interesting, perhaps not really werewolves in the purest sense, seeing as they can't really transform back into their human selves anymore unless you help them. They're just anthropomorphic wolves all of the time. Also apparently possessed by rage demons, so they're having a great time is what I'm saying. And before I talk about my final set of werewolves, I do have to mention Altered Beast for the Sega Genesis, just so I can tell you it exists. In it, we are, and I quote, a brave and awesome Roman centurion, per the manual. So of course we're resurrected by Zeus and not Jupiter to go save his daughter Athena. Our burly man stands up and eats power until he transforms into a wolf and beats the snot out of an old man called Neph, god of the underworld, who turns into a troll and in this and every subsequent level won't stop saying, welcome to your doom. Welcome to your doom. At least he's polite. We don't just transform into a wolf, we also get to be a dragon, a bear and a tiger, whereas Neph gets to be an alien plant a snail dragon, a floaty dragon magma ball, and rock steady from the Ninja Turtles. Anyway, then we win. Maybe also a contender for best werewolf game, if I'm being honest. The final wolves I want to talk about are those in the Witcher games. Jinzi, I hear you ask, did you find a way to sneak the Witcher into your video again? Yes, I did. Obviously. The Witcher games have at least one werewolf available in each game. However, much like with vampires, their lore is fantastically inconsistent. In Season of Storms, the book, we find a werewolf family, completely in control of their faculties, even when transformed. That same type of werewolf can be met in the bad ending for The Witcher 3 or even Vincent Mice in The Witcher 1, who is a crime-fighting werewolf. However, there are also werewolves who act entirely like beasts, like the one guarding the hillock in 3 or the one in The Witcher 2 on Roach's Path. In terms of lore, I'm going to explain it the same way I did with certain vampires. I believe the longer you are a werewolf, the more in control of yourself you become, as evidenced by another werewolf we meet who is tricked into killing his own wife. In the end, however, it seems he's somewhat able to restrain himself when he asks Geralt to put an end to his misery. And of course, if you're born a werewolf, you get to practice not murdering people from birth. I like the werewolves in The Witcher because they're largely tragic characters in one way or another. It's just a pity we never get to play as one, of course. I just wanted to mention them before we close out this video. Werewolves have come a long way and somehow at the same time stayed largely the same. It seems to be a running theme that monsters, at least the thinking, sympathetic ones, are not allowed to be ugly or terrifying anymore. I mean, look at this guy. That's supposed to be Frankenstein. Werewolves followed that trend as well and it's honestly a bit of a shame. And not only that, but I do think it says a lot about society. I'm sorry I had to use that phrase. We really do live in a society. Beauty is often seen as pure, innocent, and worthy of saving. Werewolves in the past were not generally great to look at. They had extremely toothy, crooked mouths, long bushy hair, frantic eyes, wrinkly, cruel hand claws, and they did a lot of murder. Even when they were meant to be likable, they were not hot. Look at Teen Wolf from 1985. Now look at Teen Wolf from 2011 onwards. Yeah, the majority of the transformations stop at a hot point. Their eyes have a different color, they get fangs, pointy ears, and maybe their hairline does a funny, but that's it. 
you know which of the werewolves in the show do look horrifying? The bad people. They're allowed to look properly intimidating and, dare I say it, monstrous. Werewolves in general were used to show our more monstrous side. Rage, doubt, insecurity, guilt, jealousy. None of these are very charming as traits go, so the monster it creates isn't either. The idea behind the sympathetic monster is exactly that. One can feel pity or love for a creature even still. We look beyond the exterior and try to understand and perhaps even help them. Then gradually, when the werewolf comes to terms with their emotions or finds someone who understands them, the curse is broken. Yes, that has some terrible implications too, of course. No one should feel responsible to fix someone else's problems like that. But that's exactly why a werewolf is a monster. It's not supposed to be nice. And this is probably the part where I would lament the loss of true monsters or something, but honestly, the old movies didn't exactly go away, so I can always rewatch those. I do highly recommend Ginger Snaps and even Ginger Snaps Back, which I won't spoil, but I enjoyed personally with the added bonus that both movies are available for free on YouTube. And of course, The Order, if you also enjoy teen drama and the fact it ends on a cliffhanger because Netflix won't stop with the personal attacks on my person. If you've watched all the way to this point and you were thinking about commenting, try to include Dark Souls in there somewhere until another tale finds us. Werewolves really aren't that complicated, as long as you use your brain, of course. <laughs> Don't leave a carcass out for others to find. Simple stuff. When I bit Wall Guy, the first thing he did was meditate for a few hours every day. It only took him a week to stop hungering for fresh meat. Solid strategy. Fast as I've ever seen anyone acclimate. Robertson was more of a eat a few people, savor the taste, abstain for a few months type of person. But he didn't eat much. Quality over quantity. And I respect that. Mike Sears, lovely fellow decided to just eat people who asked. A strange phenomenon, but there's a whole host of people just dying to get eaten by a werewolf. Pun intended. Imagine. So he shows up like a make-a-wish. You know, surprise! Nom 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 nom. <laughs> Adrian, on the other hand, decided to fight crime after I bit him. Exclusively eats murderers and other such calamities. Sometimes he gets them to sell out their whole organization first while chewing on a leg. People talk fast when you chew on their leg. And then you have the terror trio, the Aseptic Cool Stan Ray Ray. I've already apologized multiple times for turning them, but it can't be helped. And I'll be honest, at least they're creative. Every time one of their little corpse puppet shows appear, I get a kick out of it. Yes, people had to die, and they had to scoop out their innards so they could fit the puppet sticks. But Septic does really funny voices, and Ray Ray's dramatic acting is second to none. And if Coolsta thinks unrolled intestines make for fun streamers, then who am I to argue? It's entertainment, please drop the gun. 